Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. In this video, we're going to talk about grip on the handgun. Now, I think it goes without saying that grip is important. Uh, having a solid, stable shooting platform on the pistol uh, is incredibly important. Uh, it's one of the fundamentals of marksmanship if you subscribe to that and you should because the fundamentals are where everything begins but some people based on their personal training uh, their personal practice things that have been handed down to them things they figured out on their own or what have you they place that grip in a different order of importance uh, you, you know you're one through seven or you're one through nine however you're going to say which fundamental is more important than the other uh, my personal feeling, this is just my approach, my philosophy to it is grip is the most important fundamental until it's time to actually shoot. And what I mean by that is the grip is the solid, stable shooting platform from which we deliver accurate gunfire. Now trigger control, side alignment obviously play a huge part. When we're talking about the fundamental stability on the gun, I consider grip to be far more important than anything else. If you think about a handgun, um, it's going to I mean, every time you press the trigger, you're going to get a recoil. There's going to be recoil pulses, there's going to be reciprocation, there's going to be things occurring in the gun that you have some control over, but obviously not as much control as maybe you want. Uh, the better your grip is, the more control you're going to have over that recoil, the faster you can get the sights back to your desired point of impact, Speed isn't your point of aim, until it and is. the faster you what can I mean by that, again, is you there may be a situation I find myself in where I have to run the gun as fast as it mechan can mechanically operate. Now, this video isn't about trigger control, but the ability to run the trigger fast is completely commensurate with your ability to have a solid grip. If your grip isn't as good as it could be, or if you haven't really put a lot of thought into fine-tuning your grip, uh, you may be able to run the gun very, very fast, but your accuracy is going to suffer. And it has absolutely, it has, well, I'm not going to say absolutely, it has very little to do with your manipulation of the trigger, so much it has to do is your, your shooting platform isn't as solid as it could be. So I've got two hands, and hopefully I'll be able to use both of those hands when I need to shoot. In practice, we tend to default to two-handed shooting because that's the easiest way to control the gun. Uh, if we're only shooting with one hand, there's some issues that we have. Uh, the biggest issue is we're losing 50% of our ability to control the recoil of the gun, which means our shots may be sloppier, our group may be wider, or we just can't run the gun as fast. Uh, and there's some other issues that go into that. Now, your draw stroke, um, how you purchase the gun, your initial grip is the grip you're going to have coming out of the holster. So if you're really sloppy on your draw, or you get caught up on a garment, and you come in and you just got high enough, you come out and you've got a little bit of the tang open or something like that, that's going to create an issue once you bring the other hand onto the gun, present a threat, and start shooting. Now you can readjust when you have time. On the range, we always have that luxury. But in a real life self-fence situation, that might not be a luxury you have immediately. You might not have time to be like, okay, let me go ahead and fine tune my grip, get that sweet spot, and then shoot. Now, that's a little facetious, but I think you follow the point. If my grip isn't good with my primary hand as I draw, it's going to affect my support hand's ability to help the primary hand shoot the gun. So what hand is responsible for what job? Your primary hand is responsible for the initial purchase of the gun, the draw stroke, and obviously working the trigger and some to all of the controls on the gun depending on the firearm and how you apply things. So what's the support hand do? Well the support hand is there to clear the garment, the support hand is also there to feed the gun, fix the gun, and uh, help manage recoil. Uh, and that's going to be the biggest thing when it comes to grip is how you apply pressure with both hands to the gun. Now when I was first instructed, and I actually taught for some time, that there's a pressure difference between the two hands. Uh, I was instructed that the primary hand should be 60% and the support hand should be 40%. Another way it was explained to me is your primary hand should be the strength that you'd use to shake a man's hand. Not like a bro shake, but a firm professional handshake. And then the support hand should be the pressure you'd use to shake a woman's hand. That makes more sense to me 
than saying 60-40, because I don't know what 60-40 really feels like. Am I 45, 55? Am I 35, 65? Like, where's that at? But the, the handshake analogy made more sense to me. The problem is it's wrong. Uh, you should apply 100% of pressure from both hands to the gun to a point of comfortability and solid control. Now, if you think about what I just said, it actually kind of makes a little bit more sense. Let's have a firm grasp on the gun. Did anybody ever tell you, hey, you need 60% and 40% when you're swinging a bat, or you need 35, 65, or 75, 25 using a hockey stick? You think about anything else we use our hands for, it's very rare that you hear somebody come up with this pressure thing, where you're supposed to apply X amount, X amount. Uh, I don't know what a percentage feels like. I don't even know what my maximum grip strength is uh, empirically until I use like a grip meter to actually show me, okay, that's pounds pressure per square inch or what have you. So for me, the way I teach it is a comfortable, sturdy grip, but it needs to be a crush grip of significant strength to induce proper control. The easiest way to demonstrate that is to actually take your gun, apply pressure, bring your support hand in, apply pressure. Once it gets painful, you're squeezing too hard. Back off of it a little bit and get used to that. So pressure is a very personal decision. But I think intuitively, once you put enough rounds through your carry gun, you're gonna figure out what's too loose and what's too tight. We don't want a convulsive grip to where it hurts our hands to the point where we're gonna fatigue faster. And we don't want a pressure grip to the point where we're actually gonna cause the gun to convulsively shake, especially at distance. So grip again is going to be a personal decision but you need to have the strongest grip you can possibly have so long as that squeezing motion or squeezing pressure doesn't affect your ability to run the gun you can squeeze the gun hard enough theoretically to induce malfunctions i can't do it but i know people who can because they have gigantic bear paws for hands like catcher's mitts uh, they shoot one of these and it looks really really tiny uh, and they can actually squeeze the gun tight enough to induce malfunctions um, it's inconsistent but because it happens they've intuitively inherently fixed their grip without even really considering the problem. They think, okay, I'm squeezing it too tight, let me go ahead and adjust that. So for as far as grip strength is concerned, it needs to be strong and it needs to have equal pressure from both hands as much as possible. So what about hand placement? How do the hands mate on the gun? There's a few different schools of thought on that. Now I'm primarily a left-handed shooter, but it's gonna be the same as far as the grip is concerned, left, right, right, left. Uh, as a right-handed shooter, I'm go ahead and take the magazine out of that racket clear this is my shooting grip right there fold it in tucked in I'm gonna ride my thumb high my support hand is going to fill that natural void in the grip and I'm gonna fill up as much of that grip space as I can the reason I'm doing that is because when I shoot energy is transferred to the gun recoil that energy wants to take the path of least resistance, which means any open gaps I have in my grip, the recoil is gonna to try to come out of there. So as shooting one-handed, guns tend to recoil traditionally and towards that open grip, so they come inwards a little bit. My other hand is gonna fill in just like that. It's going to basically meet up in a natural point where I fill maximum amount of the grip possible. I'll go ahead and show you a close-up of that. So primary hand grip, thumbs high. The support hand is gonna come in and fill in that little spot right there and then I'm gonna ride my thumbs down. My support hand thumb is gonna catch this ledge on the frame to help me apply downward pressure to the gun to mitigate as much as possible recoil when I shoot. Now from the other side, fingers high on the frame till it's time to shoot. Some people tuck their finger. Uh, my hands just don't allow me to do that, so that's not some way I shoot. But these fingers need to find a comfortable place to be, and they don't want to be stacked in a way that they're going to cause an uneven seating platform in the grip. As you can see from the bottom, I filled up the maximum amount of that frame possible. Now, I was talking about applying downward pressure on the ledge of the gun, right there. Now, some people break at the wrist and roll that hand all the way forward and run the gun, run that support hand much further forward than I do. There's nothing wrong with that, it's a different technique. Again, I'm not talking about all techniques, I'm just talking about the way I do it, the way I teach it, the way I shoot. Uh, I wanna be able to mitigate as much recoil as possible, so that thumb is going to find a purchase on the gun to where I can drive downward, downward with pressure. Now, this is just a regular Gen 3 Glock 19. It's been stippled, it's got an undercut because my fingers just need an undercut. There's really nothing special about it. Now, I shoot agencies primarily. My everyday carry gun is an agency. Uh, it has built into it, or I should say modified into the frame, what they call an accelerator cut, which gives you a purposeful ledge specifically for that purpose, which I'll show you now. See, as you can see, right there is a ledge. That allows my thumb 
to get purchase on the gun and apply downward pressure to mitigate recoil during firing. Uh, this is uh, not something new. In fact, the first time I saw this ledge, it was on a USP uh, in the late 90s. Uh, and I've seen it since then, but agencies, uh, that's just one of their standard features in the guns. One of the things that attracted me to them as a brand is they put that in there and it allows me to apply, it gives me a really good purchase point over the standard Glock frame to apply downward pressure. But again, the majority of guns out there, especially modern handguns, especially polymer frame handguns, are going to give you some sort of ledge that you're able to ride. Uh, even the, you know, like the FNS or, you know, some other guns, they, they provide you with that ledge that you can use. So you don't have to have a purpose built modification like the agencies come with but it really is nice. Now, draw stroke is another thing that we always have to work on, we always have to critique. Uh, anytime I get dressed, uh, put on clothes in the morning, uh, one of the first things I do before I head out the door is I get a few draw strokes in for what I'm wearing for that day. Uh, t-shirt is a t-shirt is a t-shirt is a t-shirt, but if you think about it, if you grab an XL or a large or whatever size you wear a t-shirt, and you haven't washed it, you take it literally right out of the bag from the store, right out of the bag it came in or whatever, and you throw it on, it hasn't shrunk yet. It's going to be a little bit longer. Now, this is getting a little bit pedantic, but if you're, you spend the majority of your time practicing on a certain length garment or a certain style of garment, and you're wearing something different that day. Think about when it gets cold enough to wear a jacket or a hoodie for the first time. That's going to affect your draw stroke because there's more garment to clear. It's longer, it's shorter, it's tighter. Uh, it doesn't allow as much uh, give at the chest area when you pull it up, such as jackets. A lot of jackets or button-up shirts do that as well. Uh, so these are things that we have to factor in. But as the draw stroke occurs, I'm going to get my primary hand grip. Garment's going to come up. However, I'm clearing it. If it's two-handed, one-handed draw, I'm going to get my initial purchase. The gun's going to come out, and I'm going to start to present it towards the threat. Now, if I'm going to full presentation, I'm going to go all the way to full presentation. If I'm shooting from retention, I'm going to stop wherever I need to stop, shoot from retention, get my distance, and get my second hand involved. This hand will release the garment, and as the gun presses out, I'm just going to get my natural grip point. My thumb is immediately going to go to that trained point of index. Right there, it's going to fold in intuitively. It's going to hit it without me really having to think about it because I've practiced it thousands of times. And then I'm just going to drive the gun out, come back to my front sight, align and then start shooting if shooting still needs to take place. We don't need to get wrapped around the axle so much but we need to make sure the grip is precise, we need to make sure the grip is strong and make sure the grip is the same every single time. Stability is going to aid you in recoil mitigation which is what your support hand is primarily there for. It's also there like I said to feed the gun. So when it comes to one hand shooting your actual one hand grip, we need to kind of focus as much on that as we possibly can. If you've got 50 rounds of train, you should be firing 10 to 15 to 20 to 25 of those one handed only. Because this hand is the dominant, it's going to be the primary. This hand sometimes is a luxury. If this hand is needed for something else, my grip with my primary hand is going to be far more important. So the big points of your grip. Uh, apply as much strength as you need to, apply as much pressure as you need to to be able to maintain a stable shooting platform. Uh, make sure that your grip is consistent from the draw stroke. And make sure your grip is consistent for one-handed shooting and two-handed shooting. Now, the support hand is there to help mitigate re recoil. When it's on the gun, that is its main job. It helps control, but its biggest job is to help mitigate recoil. Because me, I don't, and again, you may do it differently. Or you may have been taught differently and if it works for you keep doing it but you can try it this way and see if you can increase your efficiency or figure out you know the way i'm doing it's fine i'm just keep you doing it that way when it comes time to drive the gun i drive from my primary hand my dominant hand uh, that's not something i do on the rifle with the rifle i drive with the support hand because i'm moving the barrel versus trying to move from the back but with a handgun i'm going to drive all my steering comes from this hand this hand's just there to help mitigate recoil feed and work the gun uh, it does provide stability and support obviously but, like I said, main job is mitigating recoil. So when it comes to mitigating recoil, how effective is it, my method, and maybe different from the way you're doing it, applying that downward pressure on that ledge? Well, as an agency, it's a field 19, so it's got their built-in uh, cut. So I'm not going to use this one uh, for the demonstration. I'm going to use my regular Gen 319 that has just a standard frame, nothing special, no support cut. And I'll go ahead and put it on the slow-mo, and we'll see my way, or I should say, it's not necessarily my way. A lot of guys do this. I'm not going to claim ownership. Uh, the way I do it versus the way that some other people do it as far as the thumb just kind of hanging out not really doing anything important.
And that, as they say, is that. As you can see, there was there was some difference. Uh, is the difference huge? That's for you to decide. I think the difference is significant enough, and there's no drawbacks to using to applying my my support hand grip in that way. So it's something I'm going to keep doing. Uh, mitigating recoil is hugely important to me because the, the better I control the recoil, the faster I can get my sights back on my threat and deliver more accurate fire. Uh, now, speed shooting is not the end-all, be-all, and I, I talked about that in the beginning of the movie, but it, or it, beginning of the video, but it is incredibly important. The faster I can deliver rounds on my threat, hopefully the faster I can incapacitate them. I want to put as many holes in them as I can, as fast as I can, in the shortest period of time possible. If I can't get the off switch, if I can't get the brain stem, I need to be basically ventilating their vascular system, which means I need as many rounds as I can get to shut them down. Now, I'll stop shooting as soon as they stop being a threat, but I don't know how many rounds it's going to take, and I don't want to kind of try to crystal ball or ballpark that because that's just a silly idea and a silly thing to get in your head. I'm not going to fire two unless two is all it takes. I may have to fire 10, may have to fire 15, may have to work through a reload. Uh, less likely, but still possible. So when it comes to your grip, you need a vice. Your hands need to be a vice. There's a lot of strength training exercises you can look up on the internet to teach you, you know, how to make your hands stronger. But your hands need to be as strong as possible to provide the flattest profile on your recoil uh, control. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.